I will begin this presentation by reading one of the more fancier menus I've come across recently, which will provide the foundation for this presentation. Redgate Farm partridge with roasted peach, pan cheddar and hazelnuts, $36. Silk handkerchief pasta with hand pounded pesto, cherry tomato and ricotta, $32. Nanjing style crispy, ro crispy roast pork belly with coriander, peanuts, red onion, and sesame seeds, $38. Cape Grim, dry aged, 36 month old, grass fed, ribeye on the bone, 350 grams, 63 days, $60. True A5, Kobe beef from Hyogo Prefecture, Honshu, Japan, with bone marrow, fingerling potatoes, smoked bacon, and pearl onions, $85. Now for the star of the menu. Fish of the day, market price. Yawn. Now that's not very inviting for my taste buds or my wallet. Um, there's definitely room for improvement on the menu here, but that's the sad fact of most of the top end of town menus today. Most of our fantastic seafood stories are hidden under fish of the day or catch of the day, and 70% would be imported for the day. All the mouth-watering dishes I've also touched on, except for the stinky wet fish with the hidden price tag, all have key marketing ingredients for today's success in a crowded menu marketplace. Brand, provenance, quality and a food experience. The hidden seasoning to all these fantastic dishes is sustainability. In the fish game, sustainability has almost reached saturation in the marketplace and we are now looking for the next buzzword. But sustainability still remains a very important ingredient, almost to the point where it needs to be defined on menus. This is especially the case for a fish that I handle on a daily basis and I'll touch on this a bit later. A lot has been learned from other protein marketing. Meat and Livestock Australia and Australian Pork Limited have done fantastic jobs in the past. Their success though is underpinned via a national peak body with sizeable marketing funds to match. Unfortunately, the Australian seafood industry lacks a, a national peak body to satisfactorily represent its interest in seafood marketing. We are left to fight our own battles in a very crowded marketplace. The seafood industry has been slow to react, but a quick word of warning for all the other protein producers in the crowd. Our industry has much sexier stories to tell than the free range chickens, the happy pigs, the grain fed cows, or the Sam Kekovich lamb chops. As an industry, we are slowly removing fish of the day, along with the hidden price tags from menus and replacing them with high quality Australian sustainable seafood experiences. We were by no means the first in the seafood branding game. There are some great examples in our industry that have come before us, such as Cone Bay Barramundi, Kinkawooka Mussels, Hue and Salmon and Fremantle Octopus. All of these examples include the key ingredients for success, such as brand, provenance, quality and a food experience. The future is very bright for our industry. We have many untold stories on the verge of hitting local and international markets. We all have fantastic products and what other protein is being endorsed by health professionals around the world to form part of your recommended dietary intake. Timing also seems to be perfect giving the raft load of consumers now seeking out protein with a story after watching all the TV reality cooking shows such as MKR and MasterChef. So I'm here today to explain my personal journey on how we turn this guy, the, the Patagonian toothfish, also known as a Chilean sea bass, from the kiss of death to becoming a seafood marketer's dream fish. In the late 90s, the Australian toothfish fishery was under full attack from international fish terrorists, which, also, which almost decimated the Australian stock to depletion. This illegal, unreported pirate fishing caused all sorts of threats for our operating future, particularly in the area of marketing. The Australian toothfish fishery was highly regulated and sustainable, but the actions from a few environmental vandals had devastating effects on global trade. It didn't matter what we did right as a responsible Australian fishing company, we were continually tarred with the wrong brush and denied access to many global markets. The perfect trade storm was upon us, not only at a stock level where we've been decimated, but also from a trade point of view. Toothfish was red listed in every single publication and website. The big NGOs such as Greenpeace were condemning the capture of toothfish and restaurants all over the globe were taking toothfish off the menu. Major supermarket chains such as Loblaws in Canada ran anti-toothfish campaigns like take a pass on sea bass and left the cabinet space empty at deli counters with tickets 
showing they don't sell sea bass and suggest alternative species. Even the biggest shipping line in the world, Merce Line, banned all manifested toothfish cargo. This was a major obstacle for us given that export was our major market. My colleagues though have done a great job since to get the fishery into its current state. Considerable investment has been made into science, tightening the borders, eliminating illegal fishing and successfully ob obtaining third party certification with the Marine Stewardship Council and best choice rating from the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Third party certification was our first step in the long road to rehabilitation. Unfortunately, no one believes the fishers are sustainable, nor do they believe the fishery scientists, managers or the government, but they will believe in an independent third party eco label. Momentum started to shift for Toothfish and timing for our MSC certification was impeccable. Leading supermarket and restaurant chains around the world declared they would only sell MSC certified seafood as they trusted that third party eco label. Exports started to flow again for us. We gained access to markets previously not open to us, particularly across America. The premium achieved for supplying certified toothfish was US $2 a kilo higher than non-certified. This was a significant payoff for the tonnages we deal in and we started to see the value of eco-labelling. Third party certification wasn't the silver bullet though. Toothfish generally still had a bad reputation, especially amongst chefs and the general public. Toothfish was just toothfish and a vast majority of chefs, especially in Australia, would not menu it given the bad publicity. At the same time, a massive network of marine parks were announced across Australia, the super trawler debate made national headlines, five million recreational anglers were outraged and the commercial fishing industry was lacking complete social licence to operate. We are a proud Australian company with a great reputation internationally and needed to tell our story and, and win back fans for Australian seafood. I was impressed with the work, branding work done before our time and I started to think, how can we do a bit more to leverage our great story? It was time for a new game plan. We had to develop a brand to differentiate our toothfish from the rest, educate end users and the general public that were brainwashed with the wrong information used for parliamentary votes, update all the NGO websites, including Wikipedia, which still had f information that was 15 years old, Sh chefs were still reading that, um, and finally, empower chefs and retailers to tell our story. We're, we're not big enough for the effective reach by ourselves. We need the help from inf influential players. In the seafood trade, fishers usually market their catch to wholesalers who don't care for the background story. They're only interested in price and getting the best margin possible. Trying to sell to these guys a new branded product with a genuine provenance story would fall on deaf ears because they're only auto takers and not seafood marketers. In 2012, we bypassed these wholesalers for some valuable research and visited 40 high profile chefs around the country to start work on brand development. 50% of chefs loved eating toothfish but were under the impression it was endangered or illegally caught still. The other 50% had never even heard of toothfish, including some very high profile chefs. Most of them didn't even know there was an Australian fishery nor did they know we had the highest rating of sustainability possible for any fin fish in Australia. Immediately they started to ask questions. Where can we buy this sustainable toothfish from? How deep are the fish caught? Where is the fishery? How big are the boats? How cold is it down there? How long are you at sea for? We opened up a conduit between fishers and chefs that revealed so many missing parts to our sales and marketing. Chefs were hungry. They were hungry for information and always on the hunt for new high quality Australian seafood products that they could put on their menu. Chefs loved the background story too, fighting off the pirates, going to sea for three months, catching fish in 2,000 metres of water, battling the 10 metre seas, the 70 knot winds, snow, sleet and icebergs. It was the most extreme ocean to plate story you could put on a menu. Often they would ask if I'd been down there and I would say yes. The first six months of my life with Austral Fisheries was in the sub-Antarctic on a toothfish boat. That was instant street cred and an all access pass to the kitchen was generally granted. <laughs> so with the help of our new professional friends, we asked if we could offer you a toothfish, what would the product look like? Which brand would you prefer? Which brand sounds better on a menu? What format do you want it delivered? Do you prefer whole fish, cut into fillets, cut into steaks, vacuum packed or shatter packed? Skin on or skin off? What size fish? Are you okay with frozen? 
We also cooked samples and gathered valuable insights into the fat and flavour profile of each size grade. The unanimous brand result was Glacier 51 toothfish. This was the actual geographical location where the fish was caught and it immediately gave customers a sense it came from a cold yet pristine environment like Antarctica. 70% of the R&D feedback pr favoured producing two matching three kilo skin on vacuum sealed fillets on a blackboard to show up the white flesh, packed in a carton with an MSC logo prominently displayed to ensure what they were purchasing was the real deal. Our product was designed by chefs so it had the best possible chance of success in the marketplace. We went further and incorporated a QR code which chefs could scan and reveal on Google Earth Maps where that fish was caught. After we launched Glacier 51 Toothfish at the Noosa Food and Wine Show in 2013, we kicked off our end user campaign which involved another 1,200 restaurants around the country with a product brochure, a cutting guide and a 150 gram sample for cooking. Only about 300 of those restaurants menued toothfish after initial visitations, but those 300 spread the word like wildfire, on, particularly on social media. Chefs are quite tech savvy and they're all using Facebook and Twitter to communicate with other chefs and consumers. Every week we would receive new product photos and praise from restaurants and chefs all over the world proudly showing off their new creations. Glacier 51 Toothfish was going viral. Positioning of our branded product in the retail market went straight to top of class and so did the price. The Kiss of Death fish went from $30 a kilo when I started to $120 a kilo within six months. Retailers loved our story and so did their customers. Branded menus were popping up all over the country and our story was promoted on a level way beyond expectation. A fish that was almost poached to extinction is now found on Qantas international first class menus from, with, from flights departing Sydney and Melbourne. Now we have a team of champion chefs advocating for what we do, providing quality Australian sustainable seafood to the world. Although the mind it took 